Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am excited for another episode of the Industrial Real Estate Podcast. And this is a bit of a continuation from last week's episode where I had Richard Ash, former NFL player, turned into industrial real estate broker. And in this week, I've got a former corporate sales guy, very knowledgeable, very educated. He was an electrical engineer. Uh, he's got his MBA, transitioned into an industrial real estate as a second career. And just to tee up uh, how this came to be is I was in Dallas a few months ago and had an opportunity to meet a number of different people. I was there for a conference, so I met a number of people there. And then I also met a number of people outside of the conference. And my guest, David, was one of those people. And I thought it'd be awesome to have him come on the show and share how he got into industrial real estate brokerage coming from the corporate world world and everything that he's had to go through. Uh, and I think there'll be some lessons in here for anyone that is considering industrial estate brokerage as a second career, or even if you're just getting into the business, perhaps you're just coming out of school and you want to consider industrial. I think there's a lot of lessons that we can take from David's story on this. So without further ado, David, thank you so much for joining me on the call. Good to see you again. Hello, Chad. How are you doing? Uh, well, I'd, I'd be doing better if I was in Dallas by the sounds of it. it sounds like you yeah. got a nice day there, hey? I got to go do some sunbathing in a few minutes, but uh, looking forward to talking to you. Yeah, yeah, likewise. And the last time uh, we had a chance, we met in Dallas, and yes. I'm hoping to, to come back to Dallas again <clears throat> uh, in the near future. Yeah, I would love to see you. Uh, so I, I want to go through a few things. First, I, I know a lot of people are always inquisitive on how to learn about industrial real estate. I know that's mm -hmm. a question that gets asked all the time, and it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of resources on the topic. So I want to discuss uh, in, in a minute here how you embarked on that journey. Uh, but before we even get to that, can you just share with me uh, your background on how you were in the corporate world, how you got there, and then even leading up to your decision to and, I, and we'll jump into why industrial real estate in a second but if you could take mm -hmm. me all the way to your decision where you wanted to leave corporate sales and then we can jump into why industrial real estate after yes well i got into sales really from the start of my career i got an engineering degree and had heard about the sales path and i'm glad <clears throat> excuse me because i really um don't have the personality for an engineer you know to sit behind a desk you know mm -hmm slide rule or a you know spreadsheet the whole day and so i um, went into sales uh years ago with hewlett packard <clears throat> pardon me and uh really enjoyed it but um had always enjoyed real estate and had started buying rental properties about 25 years ago and um interestingly enough i bought my first rental property right before a huge texas crash and you couldn't sell anything and I was decided to move to California and I ran into a property manager. He said, well, you can go to closing and write a $10,000 check or you can be negative $100 a month and let me manage it. So I said, great. So I uh, bought that property for $75,000 and ended up selling it for four hundred dollars a few uh, mm -hmm. decades later in the boom. So I've always loved real estate. I ended up with seven rental properties at one point and um, the uh, had always thought about going into actual real estate brokerage and a friend of mine was going into it. So I, he talked to me into taking the test, getting the license, which in Texas is about $1,200 and a few weeks of your time to a few months. And coincidentally or providentially, the week I passed the test, I got laid off from my job uh, in the corporate world. So I said, well, let's just go do this and uh, move forward from there. So uh, the rest is history. So what was your knowledge of an, on industrial real estate leading up to this inflection point in your career? Yeah, I really didn't know anything about industrial. I guess I did have a friend who owned a couple of warehouses, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, and I knew kind of what he did, but I really had no idea. And um, I actually started out focusing more on RV parks, so closed a few of those but really just started to enjoy industrial. I, I, I'm a big fan of economics and just how the world works. And if you dig into it, really, uh, industrial real estate runs the economy, right? Every product you own or you in your house or your business, uh, every service that gets done just about is done in an industrial piece of real estate. So just started digging into it and met some great people here in Dallas and across Texas. And, um, it's just a great market for industrial down here. Very tight, very competitive, but um, have loved it ever since. And so I hope to uh, keep digging in and, of course, watch your channel. Learned a lot from you, some of the books you recommended. Um, 
and I try every day not to look like a rookie. And I've got a great couple of mentors that I constantly rely on for, you know, advice on just different things. Yeah. And I want to touch on the, the mentor topic in a bit too. Uh, when you first got started and you saw industrial real estate as this path forward and coincidentally i had the same experience when i first got into commercial real estate in 2005 i thought i'd be working on office towers or retail and just almost accidentally stumbled into industrial and i'm glad that i did because 18 years later now i'm i i love it enough that i do a podcast on it so i it's it clearly has become a, a passion of mine uh, and I'm I'm sure we both had the same type of struggles. What did you do to learn about industrial when there isn't a textbook on how to do it? Uh, there's if you like residential is a good example. If you want to learn about being a residential broker, you could find countless books on what residential is, and then you could find countless more on how to be an effective prof, uh, producing agent. In industrial, there's very little of either. So, what yeah. what was your path like to go from knowing very little about it to to where you are now? Well, like I said, I, I watched I've watched just about all of your content. So, congrats on all of that and, well, and your following you. and all that. I mean, it's been very good. Um, I really learn by doing, as opposed to, you know, I mean, I do read a lot, but. I really just went on a lot of site visits, a lot of, you know, calls and, you know, I'm hoping the investors didn't know what dumb questions I was asking, but, uh, you know, I'd get metal building, heck no, you know, and then some guy go, no, I love metal buildings, you know, just stuff like that. Um, you know, I'd never buy that cap rate and sort of just started really just doing it by learning, by, by being with people. Um, I now have enough, I'd say, investors that I count as friends that I can kind of slip a few questions into them because at some level we're peers, but, you know, some of them own 50, 100 million dollars worth of real estate. I don't think I'm going to get there. So in that case, they're almost mentoring me when they can, might be 10 years younger than me or something. But really just learning by doing getting out there. You know, you read the offering mem memorandum sometimes get information out of that. Um, here, there's a lot of good, and I'm sure, you know, other places too, uh, good events. CCIM does a lot of good events, uh, biz now, red news, uh, the Dallas business journal, they'll do just, you know, industrial real estate forums and things like that. And you'll, you'll hear these strong owners up there talking, or maybe attorneys or people like that. So really just little bits and pieces. And I love to learn and it's, it's been really interesting. Yeah, another one I could add on to that as well is Globe <clears throat> Street, uh, GlobeST.com. Yes. Globe uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's one of my favorite websites actually. Okay. Uh, I I've I've subscribed to it, so I get their weekly digest on industrial real okay. estate news. Uh, they they break their news down into asset classes, so if you just want to follow along on retail you can obviously i just follow on industrial i don't yeah. want my inbox to be inundated with with everything yeah, but that's that's one that i that i follow and biz now is another great one too I, yeah I, no, that's I, good because i get globus but i gotta admit i don't read that one as avidly so i'll, I'll put that one on top of my stack yeah, it's definitely worth worth reading. And mm -hmm. and one that a little bit of an outlier is Wall Street Journal. And yes. I, I always used to like Wall Street Journal because they didn't have that bias kind of come in from either way, like what, what you yeah. see with like CNN oh, yeah. or CNBC or Fox. Uh, it, it seemed to be more neutral. It, it seems that it's there's a little bit more conjecture and bias finding its yeah. way into it. And mm -hmm. one quick aside on it there was an article just put out uh where they talked about warehouses and the the tone of the article and the headline was something like warehouses come to a halt that mm -hmm. typical sensational yeah. headline that you'd right. normally see at I don't know, like mm -hmm. fox or cnn yeah. and i was disappointed by that because usually wall street journal is pretty objective when they just present the facts yeah. and they made it sound like the warehouse industry is coming to a grinding halt mm -hmm. well it was like, basically what the headline said but as you dig into it more it's just it's down from where what 2020 was down from 2021 numbers but 2021 yeah. numbers were absolute record numbers yeah. so I, I would equate it to you know like a basketball player so let's say uh, uh lebron james as an example goes out and he scores 70 points one night and everyone's like that's an mm -hmm. amazing accomplishment and then the next night he goes out and he scores 50 points right. does that 50 points look 
less impressive yeah. because he scored 70 before when perhaps his average is 30. Yeah. Well, the 50 is still an incredible number. And and that's what I think we're seeing with a lot in the news. I was a little bit going off on a little bit of a tangent, but no, you and I had coffee. I agree. I we well, I love the journal, but I do find the national view of real estate. I mean, real estate is so local and even within a city can be, you know, sub markets. And then, you know, the difference between class A and C industrial is huge. So, uh, yeah, it's it's kind of you got to I like to take the big picture, but then really try and understand the, the micro. Well, let's let's dive into that because I, I do want to get your thoughts on this. Uh, I, I I know Dallas reasonably well, but it's mostly just things that I've read. So I, I know there's 70 million square feet worth of projects that were under development last yeah. year. Uh, busiest market in North America. Uh, yeah. The Dallas Fort Worth area is is arguably a be- becoming a, a major major hub yeah. of industrial yeah, activity. Yes. Uh, yeah. And I think that there's even developments happening like i think that the kansas uh the canadian pacific kansas city southern merger which should be approved by the transportation uh, service transportation board sometime this month i think that that's going to make texas even more attractive uh mm-hmm. and, and appealing to investors w- where would you say dallas is right now from it's a it's an inland market so it's not on a major port like long beach los right. angeles or new york but it's this massive industrial hub yeah. What what's your take on Dallas over the last couple of years? And then, if I could be so bold as to ask what your what you see in the future for Dallas is yeah. as well. Well, Dallas is just on a tear; it's just booming like crazy. Um, I live in North Dallas, kind of you know Central Dallas, and there not industrial, but there will be corners I've driven by for 20 years and I'll go, I'm like, where am I? There's three skyscrapers here, you know, that weren't here last year. So it's just booming so much and the outer suburbs are growing. Um, I didn't I'll get to industrial in a minute, but I, I've talked, I talk a lot to residential agents and they are still getting multiple offers down here, particularly mm-hmm. for the 300,000 to 400,000, you know, kind of, <clears throat> starter homes maybe if you will or smaller homes um industrial it's just booming you know we don't really work with the class a you know, the, the beautiful you know 500k and up square feet up at the airport but you just see what they're doing out there um but some of the markets we work in there's just huge demand for you know multi-tenant industrial shallow bay um some big ones you know some hundred thousand and up but just really big tenant demand for for all things industrial, whether it's manufacturing, distribution, you know, smaller contractors, smaller businesses. So I work a lot in the southern and the eastern parts of Dallas, the suburbs down there, and you know, Forney, Lancaster, Rockwell, they're just really booming with industrial. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, once again, we also have a lot of pollen in Dallas. But um, you asked about the future, and uh, since everybody else thinks they can predict the future. I'll do it. Uh, I really think we're going to continue. I I guess I read a lot of macro things that were as a country poised on a recession possibly, but I really believe Texas and Dallas will be, as they say, last one in first one out. There's just so much demand to be here. Um, On the industrial side, I'm working a lease where I've met with a lot of landlords recently and the tenant demand is still very strong. So this is a, 7,000 square foot kind of typical flex lease, but uh, vacancy rates are low. So I'm, I'm very bullish on Texas and Dallas going forward. I'm glad you brought up that part about there being a difference between that class A, call yes. it the 500,000 to a million square foot product and call it the rest of industrial because yeah. I'm, I'm actually with you. I, I Everything that I work on as a broker is in that other tier. Everything that I own myself as an investor is in that other tier. So it's funny that we often gravitate towards hearing, and I know I'm culpable of this myself, of talking about this large class A big box yeah. uh, inventory, even though I, I personally don't work in it either. I follow it very closely because I think it, it offers a bit of a barometer for, for the market as a whole. Yes. You have to know what's going on in that right. space. But right. there is that whole other side to industrial real estate, which is, is a, a massive, massive part oh, of the yeah. industry. Huge demand, yeah. So so let's jump into that a little bit more because I, I'd love to just get your perspective on uh, coming from the corporate sales world into, into industrial real estate and you're working on similar type of product. 
th- that I am. What was what was the learning curve on just getting up to speed on both your local market, getting to know all the inventory, getting to know all the players, and then just getting to know what tenants want and what the supply actually can offer. And and just to clarify on that, like just what what makes that older and not necessarily older, like it doesn't need to be like a 80 year old industrial building, but it could even be yeah. like a 30 or 40 year old industrial building. Mm-hmm. What was, what was the process of you getting up to speed on that? And what are some of the important things you've learned along the way? Well, I, I love this business because I'm still learning. I mean, every week, every day, I learn something new. And it's, it's to me just fascinating. I came from the IT and the technology world, and I find industrial real estate more interesting than that. I don't know, maybe mm-hmm. I'm just a weird real estate geek. I'm with you. I'm totally <laughs> with you. <laughs> and, you know, in the corporate world, you typically have an engineer that's doing the design and they're really in the weeds and you're more the customer relationship side. So in this, I'm kind of doing, I'll call it the engineer work, even though we have an analyst and things like that. But, um, you know, I really just dove in. I mean, I'm just dumb enough to kind of pick up the phone and start calling. And I, I love talking to people. It, it surprises me that cold calling is so terrifying these days to salespeople. I just, I don't know how else you do it. Now you can do a text, email, you know, um, LinkedIn and things. But to me, the more touches you have, however that happens to be, the better. But I just dove in and initially, I mean, my first deal, I just pitched a listing from somebody else that I didn't know to an investor. And, you know, sure enough, it, it, it happened. And so, I really just made a lot of mistakes along along the way. And I I think I still make some of the same mistakes. Uh, Oh gosh. I don't know. I, I just was thinking the other day, I said something stupid, you know, and it just, you know, you just blow blow, blow past it. Right. Not, not dumb, dumb, but you know, just like, like I say, I would never buy a metal building. Oh man, I'm sorry. You know, something like that. Um, And, and this market is so hot. We just closed a building in Houston uh, in December, it was a 30,000 square foot metal building uh, machine shop. And the number that the owner wanted was so high. I, I told my partner, I said, there's just no way we can get that number. And sure enough, we got that number. So even a quote expert is just hard to predict this market. It's, it's, you know, been moving so fast, but like I say, for me, it's really just diving in and, and calling people And, you know, when you sit down for lunch, a lot of my clients are these small funds, you know, 10 to 20 person shops with 50 to a billion dollars worth of real estate. And if you take them to lunch, you'll just start learning, you know, what's your buying criteria? You know, what's your background? And you'll just really learn what they like. And, you know, you know how some of them only want single tenants. Some of them love automotive. Some of them hate automotive. It's just you start learning just what what's out there. And I just find it fascinating. Yeah, well said. And and I love the point you made about making mistakes or perhaps saying yeah. something that you didn't want to say. I, I've said this uh, myself as well, is that I try to keep like a 10 to 1 ratio uh, where if I say 10 things, I just acknowledge that one of them is going to be really stupid right. or it's going to be really dumb. And as long yeah. as I keep it to that ratio, I feel like that's uh, that, that that's that's doing well. Because yeah. there's, there's nobody out there in the entire world that says something intelligent every sentence or everything that yeah. they have to say. It's just, it's just I agree. So well, I, I mentor a lot of younger agents on our team and they're just so scared of making a mistake. I said, that's just part of it. And I guess I see these investors. What is it? One man's trash is another man's treasure. Some of those I might have never buy metal building. Then got, I only buy metal buildings or, you know, I, I, we closed a big deal in Sherman, Texas last year. And I pitched it to a lot of investors. Sherman is way too far. It's up on the Oklahoma border. And I got to Sherman and the, a big landowner said, you're too late. Sherman's done. It's all been bought up. You know, so we closed this deal. It was a very good deal for an investor. But a lot of very smart guys just said, I wouldn't buy in Sherman. And, you know, somebody got a great deal up there. So <clears throat> and they've got if you follow, they've got the Texas Instruments semiconductor plants going in there and a big Apple contractor and just a lot of stuff happening. But, you know, if you didn't know, you'd miss that. And, you know, different investors. One of the things that I, I, I love what you said there is that uh, 
cold calling is so powerful and yeah. a lot of people would call that old school and you always see articles or books being written said cold calling is dead or there's better yeah. ways to do it and in my entire career i haven't found anything as effective as no. either cold calling a business or even just walking into their location yeah and i did and yeah, it, it, yeah. I think all the other tools are very helpful and there's a place for them. But I, I, I like to use the reference of a football team. Uh, and you're in Dallas. I'm, are you a Cowboys fan? We, I didn't even oh, ask you that. Yeah, it, it might be a hard week next week, but I'm a fan. So, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I was kind of like a, a, a bit of a fanboy when I was uh, interviewing Richard last. Yeah, week. yeah, I, I enjoyed that interview. Uh, but I like to use that. The, so a, the Cowboys team, you, if you want to have the best chance of winning, you got to put all your players on the field. Yeah. And I, I look at the same as in, in business or in brokerage. If you want to win, you got to have all your players on the field. Yeah. And I would look at cold calling as a very, very mm -hmm. – and it could even include – door knocking or in-person networking whatever right. it is but that that, that in-person action is a very important player on the team yeah. but you can't win a game just having that you can't win a game just having social media i think it's i yeah. think there's a part and parcel to make sure you're doing a combination of all of it yeah and when i came into this industry it, i guess it had probably in the old days had a little of a reputation of being you know cocky people you know that you know, these type A players will, people told me come in, oh man, you'll never break in. And then, like I say, these younger agents that don't want a cold call, I can, I mean, I've made thousands of calls, I'm not bragging, I'm sure you have, but I mean, I can count on one hand how many nasty responses I've gotten from a cold mm -hmm. call. Most of them are just like, yeah, man, wait, let's talk. You know, they're just very nice people interested in, you know, I think they see us as a resource. Hey, what are you seeing in the market? You got a property? Let's talk about it. So I, I've made really, I would call them friends just in the years I've been, you know, business friends, but really made a lot of great contacts in this business. I, I completely agree. In fact, <laughs> one, of, one of my very good friends is one of the uh, guys that I cold called 12, 13 years ago mm -hmm. uh, and then ended up doing a couple of deals with their company and him and I have become good friends actually. So yeah. like even beyond that, that business friend where I've made many yeah. of them, he was, he's actually a good friend of mine now. So yeah. I agree. It's just, it's a surefire way to do it. And, mm -hmm. and I think everybody has some hesitation to doing it. And mm -hmm. I, I don't have a great way of, of recommending how to get over that hesitation or that reluctance. I think also that everybody needs to balance their career with what their goals are and how happy they like it. And if yeah. somebody just hates cold calling and, and they feel that that's not a path forward on their business, right. then either find another business or find a way to work around that. And maybe yeah. that is partnering up with somebody that likes to cold call and maybe yeah. you help work all the, all the, the leads mm -hmm. that come in or you do tours or you do the meetings find a way around that but if you don't have if you don't have a way of making your phone ring and in my mind that's if you're making a lot of outbound calls or you're doing social media or whatever you're doing you've got to find a way to make your phone ring if yeah. you aren't doing that then you're going to find it to be a very very uh tough business to work in so. so i think if you aren't doing it if you just hate it that much then don't sacrifice your career for it because i'm yeah. I've, I've said numerous times uh, on this i love this career there's nothing else i would rather have done nice, yeah, it's, it, it, I absolutely love it. But I can also appreciate that some people hate elements of it. Yeah. And that might be a hindrance to them either succeeding or even staying in the business. So yeah. find find a solution. If you can't do it for whatever reason, and, and I think as you would emphasize, David, you, sh you should be doing it. But if mm -hmm. you absolutely can't do it and you think that that would uh, push you out of the business, then find a way to partner yeah. with someone that is doing it. Uh, be yeah, because I agree. I, I, I I love how you're doing that. And you remind me a lot actually of, of Richard, David, not that you're six, four and 310 <laughs> pounds like, like Richard is. Uh, but what, what Richard uh, said, and, and you've said now, which really uh, struck a chord with me is that Richard came from the NFL. He was a very successful athlete, but when he got into the business, he was humble. He yeah. said to a lot of people, I just want to learn much like you. He reached out to a lot of people. He was very aggressive getting in touch with people, but he was also very humble. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas a man of his stature and, and coming from his background as a former NFL player, he could have been a lot more <laughs> uh, egotistical about it, but he was yeah. very humble. And I'd say the same uh, about you, just uh, the times that we've got to chat and, and meet in Dallas, even though you've 
have your engineering degree and you've had your MBA and you've had success in the corporate world, you still went into it with, and, and I even hear as you're talking, you you still look that there's always something to learn in this business. Yeah, uh, totally. Even with your knowledge and your experience, you didn't come into this saying that I already know everything. This will be a walk in the park. Yeah. Well, and what I love about this industry, it's, I guess it's so competitive that it really is humbling. Like I say, I, I meet with guys, I'm not bragging, but just that have tremendous portfolios or agents that have, you know, 20 year track records or more like you. But I think you're only a month away from a dead month in brokerage and all these owners have so much debt they're <clears throat> excuse me they're they're challenged so it, it's just a very humbling business that probably a lot, lot like being in the nfl the minute you have a down year you're probably out you know so there's not a lot of room for error and um you know like i say i mean people just have tons of property and they're just nervous man i mean if you know the economy goes down they're leveraged up it's it's a humbling business so I love it. I, I'm going to jump into the uh, comments here in a second. We'll just hold off for, uh, for a minute here, Wyatt. I, I want to dive into that. And I was going to jump into it, but a, a question just occurred to me as you're saying, saying that, because I think that's a great point, is that we we as brokers don't want to be just order takers. We want to yeah. be able to, it's becoming cliche now, but we want to be value add mm -hmm. service providers. And yeah. I, th I think how you said that is is very powerful, is that, these, there's a lot of property owners out there. There's a lot of property owners that have a lot of debt and record breaking increases pace wise and in interest rates might yeah. be causing a lot of them to, oh, to yeah. get nervous. Oh, what yeah. are you, what's your message? And you don't have to say verbatim what you're saying if, if you've got something that, that works for you, but what overall, what is your message when you're talking to owners on how you can be that service provider that adds value? Well, really, from the start of my career, I felt like I could outwork my competition. So um, my uh, partner slash broker, uh, TJ McNeese, he calls it the three P's of commercial real estate. You uh, put put the property into co when you list it, put the property into CoStar, put a sign out front and pray. I mean, that's just his model is that was the old day. Just is my phone ringing. But we're out there. We're calling. We're digging. You know, we're at the Chamber of Commerce and really just outworking people. And I guess what I've also seen is to get these listings and other things, you've often got to pursue an owner for a year or more. So they see you, you know, we had three coffees, you know, 10 phone calls, you know, 20 emails, and then they finally start trusting you. So I just think even in, in this day of technology and media and all hard work is still hopefully purposeful, smart hard work, but hard work is, is really where it's at. And for salespeople, you just can't beat, you know, if, if you make twice the number of phone calls as someone else, you're probably going to make twice the money, uh, with, with luck playing a bit in there, you know, but we hope, what is it? The harder I work, the luckier I get. So mm -hmm. that's my yeah. maximum. <laughs> they didn't teach that in business school. Right? <laughs> I, know, I, know. <laughs> I know. So it's, it, it, and like I say, this is a, to me, a simple business, but a, it's so complex and broad. It's just very interesting. You know, it's, at one point, it's just simple. Just make the calls. But the other, trying to get a deal done, you know how many circles you can run in that just to get get things done. So it's fascinating. Yeah, it never is a dull day. Uh, there's a couple people that joined in from Texas. I just want to say hi to first. Uh, Ron, hey, David, hello from Dallas. Hey, Ron. Uh, Ron, it would be a great guy for you to connect with David. Yes. He's, he's a lawyer uh, in Dallas, also owns industrial property. Uh, awesome guy. He's got a YouTube channel as well, talks about industrial real estate. So I give Ron a shout out <laughs> and urge uh, people to check out to him. But you should connect with Ron. David, uh -huh. he's a really good guy. And then uh, Josh uh, also joined in. Uh, go, David. Uh, Josh from Texas, thanks for joining in. And thanks for the comments. Yes. Uh, I, I, I know how big uh, uh the uh, people loved talking about uh, Texas and, and I agree. I'm very, very bullish on Texas. I personally want to uh, buy a property in Texas in the, in the near future here. So yeah. we'll, we might have to talk on that too. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and then Julian joined in, uh, go property managers back to the point about you uh, potentially losing $10,000 or a hundred dollars a month. Yeah. Turned yeah. it, what was it 70,000 into 400,000? Yeah. Yeah. It worked out very well. So, yeah. And, and I actually do want to have a property manager 
on the show uh, and I'm, I'll reach out to Julian to see if he'd be interested. Yes. Uh, I, I think that there's actually a misconception about how valuable property managers are like, yeah. I, and especially for people new to industrial real estate where perhaps they just went from the residential side where I don't want to, I don't want to oversimplify what a residential property manager does, but I think that there's a, even a misconception there that they basically just collect rent. Uh, and then if there's an issue, they, they deal with it. I think a, a smart, prudent commercial property manager can, can be going back to that cliche again, they can really add value to the property yeah, just on, so. on some of their systems and record keeping and tenant management. And, and if they even approach it from a standpoint of being asset managers uh, on your behalf, uh, I think that there's a tremendous amount of value that a property manager can have. Yeah, I agree. And and I think there's also something to, you know, stick to what you're good at. I'm a salesperson and I actually got sucked into managing some properties last year. Well, a big property and we ended up selling it. But my partner and I are both sales guys and <clears throat> we just we just, you know, keeping all the records and the working with the contractors. I mean, it's not rocket science, but if, if that's not your personality. It's uh, just like cold calling, you know, if that's not what you do, um, you know, just to be looking through all the contracts and all of that is is, is a special skill for property yeah. management, I think. Yeah, it really is. Mm -hmm. And then I, uh, Beverly joined in and she posted a link to your LinkedIn uh, for that. Uh, yes, thank thank you, you, Beverly. Appreciate that. I'd love uh, to talk to anybody out there. Yeah. I, 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 and we'll, we'll I found you. <laughs> you're, you're right. You're right. I and we'll, you, yeah. We'll talk more about uh, how people can get in touch with you uh, at, at the end of the show. Uh, but there's also a question that came in from Neil, Leadership to Wealth. Uh, how do you approach people that want to mentor you, that you want to mentor you? And actually, I'll add on another question. Great question, Neil. Two-part question. I love two-part questions for some reason. I, I don't I don't know if it's just my brain moves uh, at, at a pace that's uh, that's unsustainable, but I, I tend to stumble people up on these. So I apologize if I do. Don't feel bad if you don't answer all of it. But how do you find people that you want to mentor you? And then you also mentioned that you're mentoring some of the uh, younger guys in your office. So how do you mm -hmm. find people that you can mentor? Two-part question. Answer them both or answer one. I'll see if I can have a follow-up. Yeah. Well, as far as my mentors, and it's funny, I really didn't have good mentors in the corporate world. It's so, I don't know, just cutthroat or so many changes. You know, I, I mean, I was at a very large company for 12 years, had 15 bosses in 12 years. So that tells you the dynamic aspect of that. But um, in real estate, I've just... I've got a friend who is a longtime agent. He's 70 years old and he very, you know, energetic 70 year old. And by the way, he still makes cold calls every week after 50 mm -hmm. years and the 45 years in the business. But, you know, I have just known him before I was going into the business. And so we've just been doing regular lunches. And I guess I just slip a lot of questions. I ask a lot of questions to everybody, you know. And so I just sort of have said, thanks for mentoring me. And he's great, you know, with that. And then I have a lender friend and she she's just super knowledgeable about, you know, loans and, um, you know, structuring everything. So I, I've just sort of taken her out for coffee and hit her with 100 questions. And I guess people either get sick of your questions or I'll keep answering them. So it's kind of, both of them will really be patient with me. And then my two partners, uh, TJ McNeese and Wayne Murphy, both longtime real estate guys, and what I've discovered <clears throat> with both networking and mentoring is if you want to somebody to mentor you, you want a smart, knowledgeable person, but they've also got to be willing to give you the time. And so same with networking. If you want someone to help you with their or help, you know, open their Rolodex to you, they've got to have a great Rolodex. But if they don't want to give any time or intros, you know, it doesn't matter. So all four of those people are really just available very short notice you know i'll jump on or send them a text um and as far as who i mentor we've just brought some new people on the team and i've just sort of started having some regular lunches and coffees with some of them and you know some are more open to it than others but it's kind of a friend thing slash mentor and and i guess i really like seeing young people just on the path to success my daughter just graduated college and she has a nut, her circle of friends is just so good. Uh, she lives in Dallas and I'm sort of hoping or starting to mentor some of them 
Um, there are a lot of them are going into sales and they are just good, good kids, smart, you know, 21, 22 and, uh, you know, kind of nervous. And I just try and tell them, you know, um, one of my favorite quotes is uh, Mark Twain, I think, said that courage is not the absence of fear. It's the control of fear. You know, that the biggest person in the world is scared to death half the time, you know, but they just get up there and do it. You know? So. I think you just can, you know, give that confidence and knowledge to a young person. That's a lot of fun. It really is. And and I've had the fortune of, of helping a number of young people as well. And just to, on that note, I, I'm very encouraged with the next generation coming into the workforce. Me too. And there, there's all that m more misconceptions that, that the millennials don't want to work or, or, or they're lazy. And I, I completely disagree. Oh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure that there are examples, but there would have been examples of baby boomers uh, back yeah. in the oh, 70s that yeah. were no. running around naked at Woodstock. Oh, so you, you always find examples, but I, yeah. I'm very impressed with this next generation of, of kids that, that seem so tapped Absolutely. into into the into the world through through the internet and social media they mm -hmm. seem so tapped in uh and they seem hungry and they're eager to work i i'm sure your daughter's a great example of that as yeah. well i i i i think anybody that is either in a position to provide some help or guidance to someone that just wants to have a little bit of advice on what to do mm -hmm. or what to get into i definitely yeah. encourage you to to look into that yeah and let's say you are uh you let's say you could go back and and you're 22 years old again you just got out of school and you want to go into brokerage you want to go into anything we can even keep it very generic knowing what you know now what would you do fresh out of college to try and find a mentor wow yeah i um i don't know because i like i said i didn't really have great mentors in the corporate world um i, I think you know asking just direct question you know um if someone approached me, just said, hey, I really need advice. Can I take you to lunch or would you be my mentor? I'd be open to it. Um, and I actually remember in the corporate world asking one or two people that and they wouldn't do it. You know, they didn't say no, but they just kind of, you know, whatever. So, um, yeah, I think just be direct with it. And and it's really a, a compliment or flattering to the older person to say, oh, wow, somebody cares about my opinion, you know. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, if, if I could even just piggyback on that. Uh to your earlier point, it's kind of a numbers game to some extent, right? Like if you ask a few people and you don't get the response that you're looking for, well, don't stop. Yeah. Don't be discouraged yeah. because first of all, if you're going into sales, you need to be talking to a lot of people and expecting yeah. to get a lot of people to tell you no. So keep asking. And then if, what, what I'd also add on is that if you can say anything about that person, so let's say you want to get an industrial real estate brokerage and you find a company or a few companies that you want to talk to and you reached out to a few guys, if you knew something about that person like even even as simple as just reading their biography on their on their mm -hmm. website and and just say hey you know what I, I see you've worked with these these large companies uh i i want to get into this i just kind of want to know what the journey would look like uh you've obviously been very successful in this if you'd be open to just sharing 20 minutes of your time yeah. i'd greatly appreciate getting your advice i think that's a pretty soft message and and yeah. myself I, I i'd be open to that conversation uh, but if it's just like a boilerplate email, hey, I'm looking for someone to give me advice. Here's what I want to do. Here's what I yeah. want to get from it. Here's how I want to mm -hmm. succeed. So it's a lot. It's a lot more self-serving yeah. than than trying, especially trying to get time from somebody that's busy. So yeah, I, I, I agree. agree. Yeah, it, uh, thanks for for sharing that. Uh, there's a couple uh, or another question that came in uh graphics equipment thanks for joining in good to see you on here again how much will industrial be insulated in this impending cre downturn great question yeah i think it's going to stay strong or maybe slow down a little bit i just saw i, I like you i re read so many things and graphs and all this i think it was nationally but the you know the demand that the, the vacancy rate is still just very solid with uh um industrial um what i see is if we really had a downturn in housing like people just weren't buying houses or things like that that could maybe have a big impact because if you think about it a lot of what goes into these warehouses or smaller places is is related to the housing industry um and a lot of these smaller multi-tenant you know is um you know just roofers uh 
you know, carpenters, just all sorts of trades and things into those buildings. So I can't see it going that bad, but, you know, that's just my view. I, I think it'll stay at least moderate, moderately strong. Yeah, I, I personally, I think it's going to be a little bit like Charles Dickens said with the tale of two cities. Yes, I think so. Yeah, I, I, the analogy that I've been using lately, and I just put out a prediction video for 2023 on, on the channel, if anyone wants to check that out. The analogy that I came up with, because I thought about this long and hard, uh, and it might not show for how simple of an analogy I came up with, but I, I was trying to come at a different angle. Is I equate it to a storm coming in. So mm -hmm. a storm comes into, into a city, not everybody gets affected the same. There's going to yeah. be people that, that are in their house, that they're in a in a garage and they go from their house to their garage to their car to their office building their underground parkade they might not even notice that there's a storm other than they don't want to go outside whereas there's going to be other people and a lot less fortunate people than that that will be impacted significantly mm -hmm. more where their entire lives will be completely upset and i think mm -hmm. that that's probably happened in every past downturn yeah. in history some people are affected more than others some people aren't affected I think yeah. that that's going to happen in industrial as well. I, I The one that I like going back to is Armancio Ortega, founder of Zara, one of the richest people in the world. He bought a portfolio of properties in the U.S. last year for $900 million. Companies include FedEx, Walmart, or I don't know if Walmart's one, but FedEx, Amazon, large like Fortune 100 companies. Mm -hmm. And the weighted average lease term was eight years and change. So in my mind, that guy buys those properties, fixes his debt, knows he's got very low likelihood of default on those, and their minimum of eight years left on the lease. Mm -hmm. He probably doesn't really care for that portfolio specifically anyways, probably doesn't really care what happens in the next year. So mm -hmm. I think he'll be the, that guy that's in his house going from his car to his office building and not even thinking about the storm. Whereas there's going to be guys out there who <clears throat> bought perhaps at the absolute height of the market call it right. i don't know if we could pinpoint when that would have been yeah. or not but if they bought at the height of the market and perhaps was more speculative and interest rates went up 300 right. basis points i think that they might have a different outcome on this so yeah. I, I i don't think it's black and white i don't think there's going to be all winners and all losers i think that there's going to be some people that are in a losing position that find a way to increase their their hand they they find a way to make their hand oh, yeah. better so like yeah. you you had that house of so seventy thousand dollars could have lost ten thousand on it you found a way in this case was a property manager to yeah. help you get through that and you came out a winner so you yeah. could have sold and been in a losing position but you repositioned you restructured you finagled your way out of it and yeah. you became a winner i i think that's that's what this is going to be as well well, and the one thing sort of, uh, you know, I think industrial will be okay. The one thing I'd like your opinion on this is the debt. Most of the debt I hear about is five-year debt. So, you know, if you bought a property, let's say at 3%, in other words, interest rate of 3% debt, and now you're going to have to refinance at six, well, all your NOI and your DSCR, all of those numbers are based on a 3% and your payout to investors. So, I would think as some of these loans come due, that may have a big effect. Do you do you think about that, or what's your thoughts? Yeah, and and my uh, a partnership group where we have properties, we have one property coming up for renewal. I think it's August of this year, uh, and then that's the only one we have coming up this year. That will be a problem. Like we mm -hmm. we will be seeing. So I think that one. I have to look back. I think our interest rate on that one is. 4.5%. And now we're probably looking north of six. It's my guess. Maybe that eases a little bit, but I'm, I'm guessing we're going to see at least 150 basis point increase in that. Yeah. I I would look, and August is still a long ways out. I mean, if, if this last three years has taught us anything is that you can't predict anything no. six months out, no. let alone no. trying to no. predict uh, no. years no. out, uh, which no. it moves so quick. If, if it was right now, if we had a mortgage coming up, I'd be tempted to actually float the debt uh, and, and just get a, get a yeah. variable rate mortgage and just try to ride that out for a year. I, I think yeah. 
and everything that I say is a pure guess when I'm trying to mm-hmm. predict into the future. But I, th- I think that interest rates will plateau uh, mm-hmm. at some point here. And the, there's just too much government debt. There's too much corporate debt. There's too much personal yeah. debt. Uh, I, they're going to, I, I, th- I think if anything, we'll probably see more downward pressure as, as these mortgages start coming up and mm-hmm. people debt starts renewing and their variable debt just keeps increasing. Yeah. I think we will get to a point where, where the feds have no point, no choice, but to lower interest rates yeah. again. I just I that. that this year is that 2024 mm-hmm. I'm just speculating again. Yeah, no good point. <laughs> when I think the financing, it's just so interesting. Real estate is an interesting thing, but then you had the financing behind it and people with skills in financing. Like you said, I hadn't even thought of going to a floating rate. That's interesting. Yeah. And, and it really goes back to having that full team. Like I, I'm a big believer of that uh, as, as a broker myself. And I'd like to think I have a little bit of knowledge on property management, a little bit of knowledge on finance, but I have nowhere near the expertise as someone that does that day in and day yeah. out and knows yeah. all the in- nuances and things to do. So I, I'm a big believer as a broker when I'm advising clients, round out your team. And as an investor myself, you need to have a full team. And, and Ron, being a lawyer on here is a perfect example. Yeah. I don't want to try and interpret a legal document and make a recommendation on that. Now, then I'm holding myself out as a lawyer and all the legal risks oh, that come with that. Yeah. That's a terrible idea. So yeah. I think having like a good finance guy uh, is is imperative to have on your team. And I'm going to try to actually bring on a finance guy in the near future here just to yeah, get his on, on what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big believer in two heads are better than one, even if it's, you know, someone without even a lot of knowledge, they can just sometimes see things that are just right in front of you that you won't see. You know, I, that's why I say I rely on my mentors all the time for just questions and, you know, ideas. I'm talking to a guy at three o'clock today, just, Hey, what about this land? What do you think? You know? So it's, it's interesting. This really is a relationship business where it's it very, completely. very difficult to succeed in any capacity in any profession uh, yeah. related to this industry without having a, a wide network of connections. Oh, that you can absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's um, I got a few more questions from Ron. Uh, legal, <laughs> top legal <laughs> advice from brokers. I, I couldn't yeah. agree with you more. It's, yeah. it, it, it's dangerous. It's it, to, for a broker to make comments on, on a legal issue. Oh, absolutely. Not only are you holding yourself out uh, as a lawyer, but now like the lawsuits, the lost deals, lost reputation. There's there's so much negative mm-hmm. negative things that can come from holding yourself out as a lawyer. Our our deal is we we connect buyers and sellers, tenants and landlords. Yeah. Uh, have, have yeah, I I've said it enough. I Ron, you know I'm a fan of yeah. yours. You know that I'm a I'm a big advocate of lawyers. Uh, to be fair, you can distinguish between construction and maintenance trades. Yeah, yeah, very true. Yeah, that's I think that's a good point on that as well. Mm-hmm. So let me get because you're a world traveler too, David. So let's let's <laughs> pivot over to this point. What have what have you seen in other markets? And I don't know. Like I'm such an industrial real estate nerd that I check out other industrial markets yeah. when I'm in, when I'm in cities and towns like that. So I don't know if you go uh, full on nerd like that. But what what have you seen in your world travels? What 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 does the U.S. look like right now from an economic standpoint or just a future prosperity standpoint to with some of the other places that you've been? Well, um, I, I'm very bullish on the United States. I, I, I've traveled a lot. I've been to about 30 countries and I, I, there's nowhere else I'd want to live and nowhere else I want to live other than Texas. <clears throat> My um, summer trip I mentioned to you, we went to London, Paris, Berlin and Prague. My daughter and I with some other friends. And for any of those of you that have 22 year old daughters, you know, they kind of run the show. So I wasn't able to just go geek out on industrial real estate that much. <laughs> but um you know, I just think, you know, North America, the U.S., we've got so much with resources, with the, the you know, the, the creativity. Um, I just think that I don't see those site, uh, cities or societies as near as dynamic. You know, they're, they're wonderful. They're beautiful. Um, they've got a tech sector, but I think we've just got so much more going on here. Um I think they've got a lot of social issues in Europe, you know, with um, immigration, unions. Kind of reminds me of when Margaret Thatcher was was uh, prime minister, you know, just a lot of fighting over resources. So 
I think that's going to cause challenges over there. And of course, the war in Ukraine, I think that's going to have long lasting effects. And um, so I would just say I'm bullish on on the U.S. and uh, North America in general. I think if you look at just Canada, Mexico and the U.S. as a trading block, gosh, what more do you need? Right. Mm -hmm. Tons of skilled labor, um, resources, tech, tourism, uh, finance and uh I guess if we can keep fighting each other, we'll have a much, you know, a much better future. But uh, I'm very bullish on the continent. Have you read Peter Zahan's book, uh, The End of the World is Just the Beginning? I haven't. I watch him a lot on YouTube. But, yeah, I really like him. You ought to get him on the show. That'd be great. I've I've asked. I've reached yeah. out to him. But he's yeah. doing – he just did Joe Rogan's podcast. And yeah. <laughs> he's good, isn't he? He probably is getting a lot of requests and he sees one come in from, from mm -hmm. uh, the investor real estate show. And I, I'm guessing that's low on his list, yeah. <laughs> uh, but like you, I'm, I'm a fan of his as well. And he's also very, very yeah. bullish on, on the U S particularly. Yeah. I, I think Canada and Mexico yeah. just as an extension will do well, oh, yeah. just by being major trading partners of the U S. Yeah. Uh, but, but I agree. I, I think that that is, a, it's a, great place to invest it's one of the reasons i'm so bullish on texas as well uh yeah. it's us like anywhere has has problems and there, there's issues that seem unsolvable at the moment yeah. but i think the good far outweighs the the negative uh, oh, on there so I, i'm quite yeah. bullish on it now i have a lot of friends who watch too much tv and are so negative about the us and i've read a lot of history and i i just think, you know, are we better off than the Civil War? Oh, yeah, we're better than that. Are we better off than Vietnam? Yes, we're better off than the Depression. And sort of back to your thought about young people and how so many people think young people aren't going to be able to do anything. There's a story about John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, you know, who were founding fathers, and they got to be enemies as they got up in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. But they both died 50 years after 17, you know, uh, July 4th, 1826. They died on the same day. But at the end of their lives, they had started writing letters, kind of, you know, mending fences. But the, one of the big themes was this younger generation, we, they're ruining the country. This country will never amount to anything, you know, 1820s. And so they just said, well, we tried. It's over. So we just this thing's going to go down. But, you know, here we are 200 years later, you know, so you just got to keep going. Right. <laughs> what choice do you have? Yeah, I, I think that it's, it, it's such a negative stance and an unproductive stance for those people to sit and say uh this next generation is, is lazy yeah. I, I think that there is that is first of all incorrect it's just not yeah. what i'm seeing at all and yeah. I, I love that point 1826 was it was that yeah. what when they died and, and they were writing those letters yeah. that's crazy to think that even that far back then though that yeah. that that older generation thought the younger generation was going to mess yeah. them up yeah. there's even a story about plato just lamenting this younger generation is going to you know, destroy greece you know <laughs> so uh yeah well i think that it's so it's i mean there, it's always been if it bleeds it leads that's the uh saying in the newspaper business and all and the tv but i think social media is just even further you know i i listen to a lot of macro guys and every you know some of them just the we're going to have a collapse of the currency and recession. And one guy predicted the other day, well, we're going to have a recession the second half of 23. I'm like, get on with it. We've been waiting on this recession for you know, a year. Just get it started. Come on. So I think you get a lot of viewers and your channel is very positive. But, you know, so many of these people are just horrible headlines that were, you know, have a crisis coming and good way to build an audience probably. I, I was talking to a PR uh, a lady once and, and she summed it up best. She's like, if a dog bites a man, that's not a story. If a man bites a dog, <laughs> now, now we're sending out a news crew. Yeah. Now we're talking. Uh, now we're talking. Yeah. And, and, and I want to keep this very positive. I, I think that there is trouble brewing and I, and I, I think that 2023 can be painful for some. Yeah. Where, Everybody in the industrial space, basically, even the worst off still walked out unscathed over the last couple yeah. of years. I do see that changing where there will be some people that experience some real pain. Uh, but I don't want to be that that negative. Yeah. Uh, that, I don't think that's healthy. Like <clears throat> People that consume uh, the news, that's always negativity. Like, how does that not creep yeah. into your... It's into kind your of addictive, heart. maybe, or something. Yeah. But your channel is very positive. No, I like the quote by Baron Rothschild in like the 1700s. He said, buy on blood, sell on trumpets, meaning when there's blood in the streets, buy. 
when the trumpets are out on the parade sell, you know, so uh, it's, it's going to be an opportunity. Just be, be ready. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so uh, that probably a good place to wrap up on selling Trumps. I like that. I'm mean, yeah. going to use that one. Uh, so I, I did put uh, your LinkedIn in the description yeah, and, and to to out there. there. So I encourage people to reach out to you and connect next time in Dallas. We're definitely going to uh, uh, connect as well. Uh, yeah. Anywhere else people can reach out to you or if, if they have any questions or just want to uh, um, ask you something. That's probably best. I mean, I'll give you my email address, uh, ddunaway at KW Commercial. That's just one in and Dunaway. So D-D-U-N-A-W-A-Y, D-Dunaway at K-W, like Keller Williams, K-W commercial.com. But LinkedIn, I'm on all the time, checking messages and stuff. So love to talk to folks about ideas. Awesome. Well, I, I always enjoy the time that we get to chat. So I, I appreciate your time on this as well. Uh, I do just, uh, Julian agreed, very positive. It's refreshing. Uh, thanks for that. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, that it's noticed that we try to keep this very positive because yeah, your channel is very, very upbeat and good. Uh, great, great energy. Keep it well, up. I, pre I appreciate that. And I, I, I like to say, if you like the show, hit the thumbs up button. If you don't like it, I also don't mind uh, negative criticism or criticism in general, negative comments. So if you didn't like this, smash the thumbs down button. Mm -hmm. Always looking for feedback. And uh, uh, with that, we really just do want to say thanks again, David, and thanks to everybody that tuned in live or after. Just really appreciate it. And uh, I, I, I love these interviews because I always leave feeling uh, recharged and energetic as well. So really yeah, great chat. And congratulations on all your success with the business and with the channel. So keep it up. Oh, much appreciated. Okay. See well, thanks, David. It's going to be 70s all week, man. Come down and oh, see us. I, I could be, <laughs> yeah. I, I, might, I might be on a plane later today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Right. Okay.